everybody welcome to the wine with jimmy channel here on all things wine education to help you with your wine and spirit education trust examinations wset here is a video here on wine production so this is general wine making options on the alcoholic fermentations a five part series and this is part one which is available free on youtube parts two through to five are only available on my e-learning portal. That's www.winewithjimmy.com. So if you do have any comments or questions or concerns, you can get in touch with me here by commenting on this video here on YouTube, or you can get in touch via social media or direct at info at westlandandwineschool.com. So we are going to be looking at in the, the world of yeast here on this one. So this is all around the alcoholic fermentations, of course. An alcoholic fermentation is the conversion of sugar into ethanol, also known as ethyl alcohol. And of course, we have a bit of carbon dioxide uh, and it's carried out by yeast in the absence of oxygen. Uh, this conversion also produces things like heat, uh, which of course will have to be managed in fermentations. Um, and really, we're going to begin here with yeast, and then we'll start to go on through things like ambient yeast, cultured yeast, temperatures, and so on. But let's talk about the general topic of yeast. And really, yeast doesn't get enough credit at all. Uh, without yeast, really, all we would have is grape juice. So they really are the unsung heroes of wine production. They are also extremely important in influencing flavor and aroma. Of around the thousand or so volatile flavor compounds, at least 400 or so are produced by yeast. So exceptionally important and really not talked about nearly enough. Really, in order to understand the role of yeast and what it does in terms of precursors and aromas and so on, we need to talk about the man who identified yeast and how it acts. And of course, this is Louis Pasteur. Louis Pasteur was uh, a native Arbois man from Jura, from the French Comte, living in Arbois. And people would go past his uh, his uh, residence, looking in and peering in the windows, and they would say and remark it looked like something out of Nostradamus. It was such a wonderful lab that would be found in his house. And you can go and visit his museum, in fact, in Arbois today. Louis Pasteur, in the latter half of the 19th century, discovered that yeast were directly responsible for converting the sugar in grape must into alcohol. He also correctly surmised that the part of uh, particular yeasts carrying out the fermentation could also, of course, influence the style of wine. And the very famous Bordeaux enologist and wine scientist who wrote a huge amount of textbooks, a man called Emile Peinot, very famous man, he mentions that before his time, and he's talking about Louis Pasteur, good wine was merely the result of a succession of lucky accidents. So Louis Pasteur, pivotal chemist and scientist in terms of deciphering the fact that yeasts are acting on grape juice and converting it into sugars, so of course, uh, into alcohol. Of course, um, Louis Pasteur was well known for many other things as well, but we're just talking here about the role of yeast. So let's talk about exactly what yeast are. So yeast is the collective term given to a group of microscopic fungi that convert sugar into alcohol and affect the aroma and flavor of wine. They are like bacteria, the unicellular fungi uh, that are far too far small. They're very, very tiny. As you can see, this is a microscopic picture on the slide here. So they cannot be seen by the naked eye. And of course, that's why they were for a long time really misunderstood and forgotten about, not even forgotten, they weren't even known uh, until the works, of course, of Louis Pasteur. 
Initially, yeast will need O2, oxygen, to multiply quickly. But once any oxygen is used up by the yeast, and that's in aerobic respiration, they will then switch to fermentation. The yeast species that are most often used in winemaking convert the sugars in the must to produce alcohol if the conditions are right. So that's things like a viable temperature range where it can operate. And we'll talk about that later in the season here. Access to yeast nutrients, for example, things like nitrogen. Uh, and then things like the absence of oxygen. Yeasts are ever present in the winery. And to be honest, even if you clean your winery religiously, it will find its way into every little nook and cranny, the, the, the equipment, the joins between equipment. And of course, very, very a lot in things like barrels, for instance, which are very difficult to clean, for example. So if you do go into some cellars, that uh, you know are old and they're fairly and they're underground. They're fairly sort of dusty. There's lots of mold everywhere. Of course, this will have quite an interesting amount of our yeast uh, active in that atmosphere. So let's talk a little bit here about yeast and fermentation. First of all, some things that it may produce. So, of course, as well as alcohol, which uh, is a given, carbon dioxide and heat. The fermentation also produces the three that are listed on this slide. So first of all, volatile acidity. So this, of course, is uh, aroma compound like vinegar or nail polish remover. Uh, and it, this is in the standard fermentation, but a lot of this, it's very minor and it's not enough to be uh, perceptible for the human threshold. Um, in some instances, it can be fairly high, and of course, that can be increased by things like drying of the cap. So um, in cap management, the cap becomes dry, and that can increase volatility, for example. And of course, oxidation can be a part to play in that too. Um, very small amounts of sulfur dioxide are produced via fermentation. That's all because all wines, therefore, will have some sul sulfites in them, naturally occurring sulfites. And also glycerol is produced, which increases the body of the wine. And in certain conditions, glycerol is increased, certainly when we look at things like botrytis and sweet wines produced. Um, what about aroma precursors as well? Well, um, wine aromatics from aroma precursors, uh, these precursors, the, when we say something is an aroma precursor, we mean that we find it in the grape, but um, because it's bound to sugar, it actually has no um, no perceptible detection. You can't detect it. You don't have any flavor it, if you smell the grape, taste the grape, for example. Just really, they're really generally quite sugary. Um, so we call these aroma precursors. They are locked in there and it's the fermentation which unlocks them. So they are released by the action of yeast and create aromas in wine. These are very important. So really, in this sense, Yeast can be seen as the liberator of uh, many of the lovely characters, of course, that we come to love in wine. If we don't have it, we don't have a lot of those flavors and aromas in wine. Examples include thiols, and I've put a picture of some, uh, some uh, gooseberries at the bottom right. The back picture there is boxwood. Uh, so we have those kind of things that are typically found in Sauvignon Blanc. The black currant, for example, in things like Cabernet Sauvignon. And many terpenes like linalool, which gives you that kind of uh, maybe sort of um, uh, lavender characteristic. And rose, the geranial characteristic, as you see there. And that's typically found in things like muscat, that floral grapey characteristic, for example. Now, I put at the top there, if you're more interested to learn about things like pyrazines, methoxapyrazines, uh, that will also help you here, being a precursor. Uh, so there is a video separately that you can uh, go and view about um, uh, explaining wine terminology on meth methoxypyrazines. Do check that out. So that's aroma precursors unlocked by the action of yeast and fermentation. And then we have esters. So wine aromatics created by yeast like 
esters, unlike other primary aroma compounds in wine, are not found in grapes. They are created during fermentation as a result, really put very simply, of the reaction between alcohols created by yeast and the components of the grapes. Esters are a diverse group of aroma compounds which are found in the wine up and are primarily responsible for that kind of fresh, fruity kick possessed by many young wines. Banana, for instance, and that's what I've got here, is a picture of semi-carbonic maceration happening in the background and banana in the foreground is typically produced by the production of semi-carbonic maceration, especially in things like Beaujolais Nouveau. But also things like pineapple, citrus and floral aromas are some of the, just a few of the associated aromatic profiles relating to the presence of esters. These esters are um, somewhat quite quickly hydrolyzed and over time will relinquish their dominance. And that's why older wines don't tend to have fresh fruity compounds. They, of course, move from primary into more tertiary compounds, our developed characteristics, our dried fruits, and then bottle-aged characteristics. Um, now, the action of some species or strains may also produce detectable levels of undesirable compounds, something we call uh, volatile sulfur compounds, V. SC or reductive sulfur compounds, things like rotten cabbage and things like rotten eggs, but also things like acetaldehyde, which is that kind of bruised, appley, nutty characteristic as well, sometimes desirable. Um, now, what about uh, the main sort of strain of yeast? And we'll talk about uh, a sub one as well. So here we have, of course, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. This is the most common species of yeast used in winemaking, but it's actually very rare in nature. The etymology, the naming, derives from the Latinized Greek that means sugar mold or sugar fungus. And it's also known as brewer, uh, brewer's yeast or baker's yeast also, as it's used in the production of beer and of course in baking. It really is the workhorse yeast and can withstand the high acidity as well as increasingly high levels of um, alcohol as the must begins to ferment. So as the environment changes and becomes more toxic, more alcoholic, it can withstand that up to certain points. It's also fairly resistant to sulfur dioxide in comparison to other yeast species. So if it is needed in winemaking as an antioxidant or as an antiseptic and antimicrobial, then of course it can work in conjunction with Saccharomyces, the sulfur dioxide. It reliably ferments musts to dryness, so it often produces a solid fermentation uh, as long as the conditions and parameters are set. And there are many strains within the species of Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which gives rise to the option to choose a strain known as selection for, of course, associated outcomes, particular outcomes. So, for example, some winemakers will select a strain of yeast to boost aromatic character in Sauvignon Blanc, typically in New Zealand in Marlborough while other winemakers will choose either ambient or cultured yeasts to produce a more restrained profile in Sauvignon Blanc, like in Sancerre or Puy Fumé. And then just one quick mention here of another species which is used. This is Saccharomyces bayanus, and this is really for musts with high potential alcohol and for re-fermenting sparkling wine. It's particularly well suited for restarting fermentation uh, and difficult fermentations. It's very resistant to alcohol and sulfur dioxide, so often very much pitched towards winemakers working with high alcohols. Uh, and in studies, Bayanus has shown that it can affect the sensory profile of wine, creating higher in the attributes of things like cooked 
orange peel, maybe yeasty, nutty or aldehyde characteristics in comparison to the typical uh, fruity esters that Suravisai will tend to produce. Yeast can also contribute um, to add to character and texture later after fermentation through yeast autolysis, Lee's contact, but that will be covered on a future video looking at post-fermentation maturation. This is just looking at alcoholic fermentation at this section. So I do hope that you have enjoyed this video. Um, just to recap that this is just part one, parts two through to five are only available on my e-learning portal along with hundreds of other exclusive videos to help you with your studies. Please do visit Wine with Jimmy for more information. Any comments, questions and concerns, pop them in the comments section of this YouTube video or get in touch via social media or by info at winewithjimmy.com. In the meantime, if you do find yourself in London in the United Kingdom, you know I've got schools and a bar. So come and see me for a class, a glass or a bottle. I've been Jimmy Smith. Thank you so much.